Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us for our Western Blot webinar. Today we'll be going through the basic principles of the Western Blot, and I'll show some examples of troubleshooting this technique. Remember that if you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll be available to answer some of them at the end of our presentation. So what is a Western Blot, and how does it work? It's a complicated technique, but to summarize, it's used to identify a specific protein of interest within a sample containing many proteins. First, the proteins are separated from each other according to molecular weight using gel electrophoresis. And then a specific antibody is used to identify the protein of interest. So we can determine the molecular weight of the protein of interest by comparing the results to protein standards of known molecular weight, and we can also determine the relative quantity of the protein of interest among samples. For example, in this Western blot image, you can see that the band of interest, which is the control protein beta-actin, is around 38 kilodaltons when compared to these proteins of known molecular weight, which are run side by side with our samples. In lane two, less antibody was used to stay in this particular sample, and so the band appears fainter than the others. So basically, Western blots are useful tools anytime you'd like information about protein expression in your samples, such as those listed here. They can be used to indicate whether the sample expresses the protein of interest at all, or they can be used to give information about relative expression among different samples or treatment groups. They're also useful to validate an antibody specificity if your end goal is to use it in immunohistochemistry or immunocytochemistry, as cross-reaction can be easily seen in Western blot since proteins are separated from each other visually. In this presentation, we'll go over the steps of the Western blot and talk about controls that should be used during your experiment, as well as the selection of an appropriate antibody for your assay. I'll end with several troubleshooting and optimization examples of common problems in Western blotting. The first step to a great Western blot is preparing your sample correctly, because the final result will never be of better quality than the starting material. There are three main steps to preparing your sample. Lysis, measurement of protein concentration, and reduction in denaturation. Lysis essentially solubilizes the proteins from the cells or tissue using buffers and mechanical agitation. All of this is done on ice and with the addition of fresh protease inhibitors to the buffer, because keep in mind that there are active protease enzymes in cells and tissues that can break down your sample if allowed. The protocol is slightly different for cells or tissue samples, but it's really the same concept homogenize the sample and lysis buffer and agitate, then centrifuge and collect the supernatant. Once the samples are fully lysed, measure the protein concentration. You can use a Bradford assay or BCA assay, whichever method you prefer. This will be important to know for the electrophoresis step in order to make sure you are loading equal amounts of protein per sample. The final step of sample prep is reduction and denaturation. This breaks down higher level structures so that proteins can be separated during electrophoresis according to their primary amino acid structure. This is done by adding a buffer containing a reducing agent as well as detergent and heating generally for five minutes around 95 degrees. Heating at a lower temperature may be more preferable for some proteins, particularly multi-pass membrane proteins which can aggregate at higher temperatures. Next, we'll discuss lysis, reduction, and denaturation a little further. So a few more suggestions for the lysis step, and this is important to make sure proteins are actually fully solubilized. First, as we discussed, keep everything cold and on ice if possible, and add protease inhibitors fresh to the lysis buffer. Additionally, if you plan to detect a phosphorylated form of a protein, you'll also need to add ample phosphatase inhibitors. Finally, the optimal lysis buffer depends on the cellular localization of the protein of interest, as a stronger buffer like MP40 or RIPA is needed to fully solubilize membrane or organelle-bound proteins from the cells. 
For reducing and denaturing and sample buffer, the buffer contains two agents, SCS, or sodium to decal sulfate, and either beta mercaptoethanol or diethyl-3-tol, abbreviated DTT. The SDS is a denaturing agent with, which helps break the protein down to its amino acid structure, and it also coats the protein in negative charges at a uniform ra mass ratio. This uniform ratio of negative charges will be essential during the next step of the procedure, gel electrophoresis. Beta mercaptoethanol and DTT are reducing agents, which break disulfide bonds, also breaking down the protein to a linear primary amino acid structure, which is all simplified in this image. As a side note, occasionally the protein of interest will need to be non-reduced or non-denatured, often because a particular antibody only recognizes this form of the protein. And so the reducing and denaturing steps can be skipped if needed, but most Western blots are run in denatured, reduced conditions. So once the samples are properly prepared, they're ready for gel electrophoresis. We've mentioned that gel electrophoresis is used to separate proteins according to molecular weight. We're actually separating the proteins in an electric field and taking advantage of the fact that different sized proteins will move through a gel matrix at different rates. This image shows a typical apparatus used for gel electrophoresis. The type of electrophoresis most commonly used in Western blotting is abbreviated SDS page. SDS is the denaturing agent which is added to the buffer during this procedure. PAGE stands for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, as the gels are typically made of polymerized acrylamide. So how does SDS page work? We start with a porous gel matrix made of highly cross-linked acrylamide submerged in a chamber filled with an aqueous buffer. Samples of protein lysates are loaded into wells of the gel. The well is the top of each lane, which is basically a depression in the gel. So there's space to hold the lysate until the current is applied. When the current is applied, the proteins will migrate towards the positive pole as they are coated in negatively charged SDS. Because smaller proteins are less inhibited by the gel matrix, they will move faster through the gel. And when the current is removed, they will be farther down the gel. So proteins are separated from each other according to size. Gels are made of polymerized acrylamide and cross-linked by bis in the presence of ammonium persulfate and timid. And the structure of the gel can be controlled by altering the acrylamide percentage Basically, by increasing the total acrylamide percentage, the pores of the gel matrix become tighter, which slows down small proteins. For this reason, high percentage gels are great when studying smaller proteins. And vice versa, a lower acrylamide percentage results in, lar in larger pores of the gel matrix, which allows larger proteins to migrate more easily and separate more efficiently in the gel. There are also gradient gels, consisting of layers of different acrylamide percentages, so that both small and large proteins can be efficiently run on the same gels. I would recommend these if you're analyzing a large range of, range of proteins on the same blot, or if you're unsure of the molecular weight of your protein of interest. 